Okay, so now there are a number of ways that we could go about finding out what these lambda matrices actually are. We could take a completely general route and just say, okay, let's let our lambda, well, we know it's going to be a matrix. It's going to be some element of the general linear group of some appropriately large dimension. We could probably just start checking GL4 and see if things work out. And if you don't know what I mean by GL, I would recommend you go and look at my series on lead groups. But essentially GL is just the, well it's a group, but it's just a set of all of the linear matrices. So say a matrix of the form A, B, C, blah, 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 where these are all just real entries. And then this matrix has to be invertible, which means it has a non-zero determinant. And so we could just postulate that lambda is a GL matrix and then go through and start restricting properties. We can already see that this debt lambda being equal to plus or minus one is already going to restrict. So we can already realize, okay, well, we're not looking at GL. We have to already start looking at SL because of this debt lambda is plus one. And then we could keep going through and restricting even more the components. But I'm not going to take such a general approach. I'm going to instead uh, opt for just simply telling you the answer and then we're going to go through and show that it is correct. And then later on we're going to discuss this more general approach a bit more when we talk about the group that these Lorentz transformations belong to. But for now let's just postulate a lambda matrix and check whether or not it actually is a Lorentz transformation. So we're looking for a linear transformation. Let's just try one example of a linear transformation that we already know, which would be an orthogonal rotation. So essentially what an orthogonal rotation does, just giving you the example of how it works in R2, the orthogonal rotation, we're going to represent it by some matrix R, which multiplies our coordinates, and then it's just going to produce some new coordinates, I'll call them x hat and y hat, and really intuitively we expect what these new coordinates are going to look like, they're going to be related to the old coordinates, but just rotated through some amount, so this would be the x hat, and this would be the y hat coordinate, and so the amount that which we're rotating by, we realize is actually now a parameter of this rotation matrix. And if you remember, we could express this rotation matrix as something which looks like this. So we see it depends on this parameter, but really we just need to be clear that each of these matrix elements is just a number. Cos theta is just some number. And so this is just some matrix of numbers, which is going to linearly multiply these. And essentially it's just going to shift the X line to there and the Y line to there. But physically we know that this corresponds to just rotating our coordinate axes and keeping the angle between the axes the same. This is what we've called an orthogonal rotation. And so what I'm going to now do is check whether or not an orthogonal rotation is a Lorentz transformation. So we're going to be looking at an orthogonal rotation and now I need to be explicit and say that we're going to only look at a rotation between space axes. So if we have our space time it's going to have our three space axes, say x, y and z and then the fourth dimension is time. Let's just restrict ourselves to looking at transformations only in space. So effectively what this means is that our lambda matrix is going to have the following form. We're just going to have a one 
on the time component. We're not going to do anything at all to the time coordinate, if you remember. These are our coordinates. If we have a 1 in this first component, and then zeros, the new coordinates are just going to be the same as the old coordinates. But now we're only going to affect the space coordinates. So we're going to introduce some kind of rotation matrix now, an R matrix, into the, the block that kind of is only going to hit these space coordinates. So the lambda matrix, which I'm going to consider, is going to now have this form. It's going to have a 1 in the top corner, and then it's just going to consist of this kind of block in the space part, which is going to be one of these R rotation matrices, which I mentioned. So, because we're choosing this R, we already, or if you haven't seen my videos, I would encourage you to go and have a look at them now, but we already know all of the properties of these R matrices. So we're saying that R is an element in the, the rotation group, SO, and in this case it's three because we're talking about three-dimensional rotations. So this R matrix is going to be an SO3 matrix, and it's just going to be something that looks, for example, like the following. This, for example, would be for a rotation around the z-axis, or as we've said, it's better to think of this as a, a rotation in the x, uh, sorry, a rotation in the y-z plane, and that's clear from the form of this matrix why this is a better interpretation, because essentially when this matrix hits our coordinates, the x coordinate is unaffected and it's just these y and z coordinates that are getting multiplied by something non-trivial. And so this is one of the possible rotation matrices. We are going to have obviously the others that correspond to the rotations in the zx and the xy planes. I'm not going to write down the matrices but to, you can just quite easily see what they are. You just put one in the place of the coordinate that's not being affected, and then you distribute this cos sine pattern around the other coordinates. So these are what our R matrices are going to be, and I'd encourage you to go and have a look at the SO3 video if you're not too familiar with these. Let's just now take this as given. This is what now one of our R matrices is going to be. There will be two others but let, we can just consider this one for now. And so what we're doing is we're going to check a lambda matrix of the form 1 and then the block R matrix. So you can just substitute this whole matrix into here and find this whole 4x4 four four matrix. So now it's up to us to just check all of these three conditions. This one is really easy. We can see in this matrix well, all we really have is this theta object. Theta in no way depends on our coordinates. It doesn't depend on t, x, y, or z. Theta is just an arbitrary parameter that we use to specify the rotation. And so this derivative is going to be 0. Now let's have a look at the, this condition. So we need to essentially just take the determinant of this lambda matrix. And now we can use some nice tricks from linear algebra. If we take the determinant of a matrix, which is so-called written in this kind of block form, the determinant of this lambda is going to be essentially the determinant of these two block matrices here. So the determinant of that one is just going to be a one. And so the determinant of lambda effectively just reduces to being the determinant of this R. And now, immediately, because we've said R comes from the group SO3, we immediately know, because this is the SO group, 
that this R matrix is always going to have a determinant of plus 1, but we could, without knowing about SO3, we could just simply calculate the determinant from here, cos squared minus sine squared, uh, sorry, cos squared plus sine squared, which is just 1. So, okay, the determinant is plus 1, and now our final condition. So now to check the final condition, we need to transpose this matrix, multiply by eta, and then multiply by the original matrix again. Okay, so I'll just remind you, our lambda matrix was this block, a block matrix of this form, where remembering R is a three by three matrix, or technically it could be a D by D matrix, if we're working in a space-time 1D, but let's just consider three for now. So, lambda transpose, again, taking the transpose of a block matrix is really simple. You just transpose the block elements, so it's just going to be one, and then the transpose of that R matrix. So now, just to do this matrix multiplication, I'll write it out. So this is lambda transpose times eta, just multiply these two matrices together with that. And then we need to come in on the right hand side and multiply by this lambda. And then multiplying these out again, where in the bottom corner now we have this product of our block matrices R transpose R. And now we can use uh, defining property of these R matrices, which essentially is that these R matrices are what's known as orthogonal. So because this R is an SO matrix, we just know immediately that the defining property is that R transpose R is equal to the identity matrix. So if R transpose R is the identity, that's simply all we have in this bottom corner. And now we can clearly see this matrix is just the Minkowski metric with a minus one and then all ones on the spatial diagonals. So we've checked our final property and so we've realized a lambda matrix of this form is Lorentz transformation. So basically, any rotation of the space coordinates that only affects space coordinates, that doesn't do anything to the time coordinate, if we just rotate in space, that's a perfectly valid Lorentz transformation. So we haven't really discovered anything new yet. We've just taken a transformation that we know and love, an orthogonal rotation, and we've proved by essentially showing it satisfies all the properties to be a Lorentz transformation, that this Lorentz, that this matrix is a Lorentz transformation. And now just before we move on, I want to make a brief comment that I'm going to revisit. But if we have a look at this condition now, this R transpose R equals the identity, it's looking fairly similar to this condition. If I just slightly rewrite this now, by saying that the identity is equal to our transpose, and now I can just surreptitiously insert a factor of the identity and not change anything. Just rewritten this expression in a slightly more informative way to now compare it with this expression. And so we should realize that these are, in some sense, talking about the same thing, Effectively, the expressions have exactly the same form, but we just now realise that in place of this identity, we have the Minkowski metric. And so this is now a general condition, which is satisfied by all orthogonal matrices. So any R that lies in this group, the orthogonal group of any dimension, any R matrix has to satisfy this condition, and we can just quite simply take the determinant of this expression and also find that we have to be in the group SO. 
And so any R in the group SON satisfies this, what's known as the orthogonality condition. But now we can realise a slight generalisation to this with this expression here. We can essentially realise now that this lambda is kind of satisfying an orthogonality condition, but not with a factor of the identity here, but with this factor of the Minkowski metric. And so we say that this is now what's known as a pseudo-orthogonality condition. It's very similar to the orthogonality condition, except there's going to be some minus signs introduced by this eta. And so what we say is that an R matrix is orthogonal, a lambda matrix is pseudo-orthogonal, and these expressions, well, we can just simply take this to be the general expression, and if we specialised to the case where this eta has no minus signs and it's just an identity, it reduces to this fairly trivial orthogonality condition. But now, one way to kind of talk about this group SO is by using this defining orthogonality condition. And so what we say now is that this lambda matrix is in a special orthogonal group but it's not the group with dimension n, it's now the group with dimension 1 and the n minus 1. So this is just kind of now making it clear that we're not simply dealing with a purely positive matrix here, we have some minus signs introduced. And now to make this completely general, you would say that a completely general lambda is going to lie in the group SOPQ, where the numbers P and Q are now going to correspond to how many minus signs, the number P, and how many plus signs there are, the number Q. And now whether or not P represents pluses or minuses doesn't actually matter, because you can just multiply the whole thing by minus one and change minuses to pluses, you just have to make sure that the relative distribution of minuses and pluses is kept consistent. So say a general eta might be a matrix that has so many minus ones, say p minus ones, and then q ones down the diagonal, and any lambda matrix that satisfies now this condition with our Minkowski metric with P and Q, minus and pluses, is going to be an element in the group SOPQ. So really the point I'm trying to make here is that we should really see these lambda matrices as orthogonal rotations, but now they're orthogonal rotations in a space that has distinct time and space-like parts which is characterised by whether or not there's a negative sign in part of the metric. So I'm going to revisit this in more detail when I talk about orthogonal and hyperbolic rotations, but I just want to sort of start introducing you to this idea that these Lorentz transformations are, in some sense, a generalisation of these orthogonal rotations, and they generalise to the case in which we have a non-Euclidean geometry, essentially. We have some... Minkowski character to the geometry where some of the metric components are in opposite sign to the space components. Okay, so that was just a quick comment for now, just to introduce you, to, or first of all, we saw that an R matrix is a lambda matrix, and then we reasoned how this definition is just a kind of generalization of this orthogonality property. So, now we've seen an orthogonal rotation between the space, only the space components, is a Lorentz transformation. Now let's introduce a new matrix, and we'll see that it's also going to be a Lorentz transformation.